So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Stephanie. Stephanie, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Welcome to MarineQuest 2020. My name is Stephanie, and I work here at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in the Harmful Algal Bloom Group Microscopy Lab. Today, you will learn a little bit about what our group does and see some of the really cool instruments that we use. So here's Rachel to tell you a little bit more about why our research is so important. Hey everyone, my name is Rachel and I work here at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute in our harmful algae group. Today you're going to take a look at some of the technology that we use to see some of my favorite organisms living in the ocean. There are so many amazing things that live there and everyone has their favorite, but mine are the ones that you can't see. Can you take a guess of what those might be? These organisms are so small that we can't see them with our bare eyes. They are the small or microscopic plants and animals that float in the ocean. Do you have an idea of what those might be called? If you guess plankton, you're absolutely right. There are many beautiful and diverse types of plankton like we see in this photo. Some of them are big enough that we can see with our eyes like jellyfish, but we focus more on the microscopic ones. Plankton fall into two main categories. We have zooplankton and phytoplankton. Zooplankton are the microscopic animals found in floating in the water, while phytoplankton are the microscopic plant-like organisms that we find. We also refer to those as algae. What makes these things so important, you might say? First, phytoplankton produce about half of the oxygen on Earth. Isn't that so neat? So for every two breaths you take, you can thank phytoplankton for one of those. Second, they are the base of the food web. Phytoplankton get eaten by zooplankton, zooplankton get eaten by larger fish, and those larger fish get eaten by larger animals. I'd say phytoplankton deserves a round of applause for all the hard work they do, don't you think? Just like the regular plants you find in your garden, phytoplankton also need nutrients and sunlight to grow. But what happens when their growth gets out of hand? Well, when growing conditions are just right, they grow very fast and can multiply very quickly. So one cell becomes two cells, two cells becomes four cells, and four cells become eight, and soon we have what we call a bloom. This overgrowth can deplete oxygen in the water by nighttime respiration or bloom decay, and it can also discolor the water. Some phytoplankton also produce toxins. When these toxic algae enter the food web, they can kill our fish and sicken our wildlife. This is one here that you might have seen before or heard about. We have this one in Florida. It's called red tide. Now you might be asking, just how small are these guys? Well, here you can see another algae that we have that blooms in Tampa Bay called pyridinium. Can you believe that 50 million of these cells can fit into one gumball? 50 million is a ton. In order for us to study these organisms, we have to use microscopes. Today, we will see three different types of microscopes we use here at the Institute. The first one is the light microscope. We use this one daily. We call it the light microscope because it uses a beam of visible light to magnify objects. It can magnify up to 2000 times what you can see with your bare eye. Next, we have our scanning electron microscope. It gets this name because it uses a beam of electrons to magnify objects. It can magnify up to 300,000 times, and it shows the whole surface of the specimen. This one can even take 3D photos. Lastly, we have our transmission electron microscope. This one also uses a beam of electrons, but it transmits the beam through the specimen so we can see what's on the inside. Can you believe that this one can magnify up to 1 million times what you can see with your bare eyes? That's insane. So now that you've been introduced to the coolest microscopes that we use here at the Research Institute, here's Stephanie to show you a closer look at what they do. Hello, here at the Harmful Algal Bloom Group, we monitor for potentially toxic algal species. Here I have a water sample. If you look closely, you can't see anything with your bare eyes. That's because these organisms are too small to see with your bare eyes. That's why we have to use a microscope. For monitoring purposes, we use what's called a light microscope. We take some of the sample, we put it into a chamber, we put the chamber onto the light microscope, 
aquarium uses a beam of visible light or photons to magnify what's in the water sample up to 2,000 times what we can see with our bare eyes. The three main toxic species that we monitor for are Carinia brevis, Pseudonychia, and Pyridinia bahamans. If we see any of these cells in our water sample or any other potentially harmful algal cells, we can count them on our counter and enter them into our database. Here's what you might see if you look through the oculars of a light microscope. On the left, we have Carinia brevis, the phytoplankton responsible for Florida red tide. We monitor for these cells because this organism produces a toxin called brevitoxin that can harm wildlife and cause respiratory irritation in people. If ingested, it has been known to cause neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. On the right is Pyrodinium bahamans. This phytoplankton blooms every summer in Tampa Bay and can bioluminesce at night. We monitor for these cells because this organism produces a toxin called saxitoxin that can cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. They are very active swimmers. These algae are called dinoflagellates because they use flagella to propel themselves through the water. This allows them to swim to the surface to get more sunlight or toward the bottom to get more nutrients. If we take an even closer look at the individual cells, we can see some identifiable structures, such as the flagellum on the carinia and the antapical spine on the pyrodinium. If we don't get enough information from the light microscope, then we have an even more powerful microscope that we can use. This is the scanning electron microscope. It's called that because it uses a beam of electrons to scan the outside of the cell to give us more surface structure information than we would get with the light microscope. And it can magnify up to 300,000 times what you see with your bare eye. In order to make a specimen conduct the electron beam, we have to coat it with a conductive material. And here we use gold. I have a tiny seahorse. He's been coated in gold. I'm gonna put him inside the specimen chamber of the scanning electron microscope. Once he's inside the chamber, a beam of electrons comes down from the top, is conducted into the specimen, and produces a picture electronically on the monitor. So here is our tiny seahorse. As you can see, there's a lot more detail than we could see with our bare eye. If we zoom in, we can see his eye. We can see the rings on his tail. There's his back. And we can even zoom in on the tiny pectoral fin. Another really cool thing we can do with this instrument is we can make 3D images. We do that in case we need to measure any structures on the surface to better differentiate whether we have a toxic species or a non-toxic species. Here are some pictures of Carinia brevis and Pyrogenium bahamans as seen with the scanning electron microscope. On the left, we have a Carinia brevis cell. The scanning electron microscope allows us to see detailed surface structures, such as the cingulum, which is the groove around its middle, and its flagella that it uses for swimming. On the right, we see Pyrodinium bahamans is covered with intricate plates, and we can see its signature spine. If we don't get enough information from the scanning electron microscope, then we have an even more powerful microscope that we can use. This is the transmission electron microscope. It also uses a beam of electrons to magnify, but it can magnify up to a million times what you see with your bare eye, and it can look at the inside of the cell. In order to look at the inside or a cross section, the first thing we have to do is embed the specimen in a resin capsule, as seen here. Then we slice the capsule using a glass or diamond knife so that it's thin and small enough to fit on one of these copper grids. Then the copper grid is inserted into the specimen holder, which it goes into the specimen chamber here. Then the beam of electrons shines down through the specimen, producing an image on a screen at the bottom, which is then photographed and sent to the monitor. 
For example, this is a Pseudonychia cell. There are currently 52 described species of Pseudonychia, and about half of them produce toxins. So it's very important to know whether we have a toxic species or a non-toxic species. And the light microscope and the scanning electron microscope just don't give the level of detail we need to determine this. With the transmission electron microscope, we can see within the pores of the cell and look at the patterns made by the porites. And with that information, we can better determine whether we have a toxic species or a non-toxic species. Other groups within the Institute also use this instrument. For example, this is a cyst found in a fish gill by the Fish and Wildlife Health Department. On the left, we see a cross-section of a Carinia brevis cell. You can see the organelles inside, such as the nucleus on the lower left side and the chloroplasts scattered throughout. The right image shows a cross-section of pyrodinium bahamids on the inside. You can see its nucleus right in the middle and the chloroplasts surrounding it. In summary, this is what you might see with a light microscope. You can make out that it's spherical, it's white, it has some markings on it. But if we use the scanning electron microscope, then you can make out much more detail. You can see that it has dimples. You can see that there's words and a number on it. And then if we do this, that's like what we would get with the transmission electron microscope, where we would see the inside of the cell. Wow, Stephanie, those microscopes are amazing. Aren't they? Very cool. Yeah. So now that you've been introduced to the wonderful world of microscopy, I think it's time to have a little fun. What do you say we play a game? Sounds great. Okay. Hang on, I'm going to pull it up for you. We're going to play a game called What Am I? I'm going to show you a series of pictures taken with the scanning electron microscope of things we see in real life, and you're going to try to guess what they are. Are you ready? OK, first picture. What do we think this is? Now think really small. Is it A, barbed wire, B, shark skin, or C, lizard skin? Hmm, what do you guys think? If you guessed B, shark skin, you're right. That's why sharks feel rough when you rub them the, the opposite way of their scales. What about this? Think really, really small. Hmm, interesting. Is it salt and pepper? Is it beach sand? Or is it hot cocoa mix? What do you guys think? If you guessed salt and pepper, you're right. Oh, this is beautiful. What do we think this is? This could be a sea urchin, or a sunflower, or an iris and a pupil of an eye. What do you guys think? What do you think it is? If you guess I, you're right. Okay, what about this one? Hmm, is it spinach infused chocolate? Roach feces, yuck. Or bacteria, hmm, what do we think? It's roach feces, disgusting. Ugh. Okay, what about this? This could be anything. Is it a human fingerprint? Is it tree rings? Or is it a croissant? It's a human fingerprint and you could see the sweat glands on there. Okay, how about this? Whoa. This, is it a kitchen sponge? Is it a snotty tissue? Or is it cotton candy? I don't think I would want to eat that cotton candy. I don't know about you. It's a kitchen sponge with microbes, yuck. 
OK, what is this? Is this a zooplankton? Is this an intestinal tapeworm? Or is this an alien? Hmm, what do we think? What do you think, guys? It's an intestinal tapeworm. Those things are pretty yucky. OK. Oh, how about this one? It could be A, phytoplankton, B, a mouse hip bone, or C, a human middle ear bone. What do we think? It is C, the human middle ear bone, and here you can see it in this picture. Okay, what about this one? That's pretty. Is it a fruit seed? Is it a fish egg? Or is it a monarch butterfly egg? What do we think? If you guessed monarch butterfly egg, you are right. Okay, what about this? Is this pillow stuffing? Hmm, is it bread? Or is it human skin? What do we think? It is human skin. Well, that was so much fun. Thanks, Stephanie. Do you have some time for some questions today? Sure. Great. I'm going to ask our helper to share her screen so that we can both be on at the same time. All right, sending it live. Perfect. All right, so let me scroll and see what our questions are today. First question, very popular question. How much do these microscopes cost? Wow, these microscopes are super expensive, Kelly. Um, the light microscopes cost anywhere between sixteen and fifty thousand dollars, and those are the least expensive of the microscopes. Um, the scanning electron microscope was around one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, and it costs about nine thousand dollars a year just to maintain. And the transmission electron microscope was about two hundred and eighty thousand dollars. And our annual maintenance contract on that one is about $26,000 a year just to maintain operating condition. Wow, holy smokes. All right, next question. Do you count the cells while they're swimming? No, that would be next to impossible to do because they really move around a lot. Um, what we do is we have a iodine based preservative called Lugols and we add that to the chamber or to the bottle and that stops them from swimming and allows them to settle to the bottom where they can be easily counted. All right. Now, how do you coat the specimens in gold? So we get this question a lot and a lot of kids think that we dip the specimens in gold, but we don't we don't dip them. We have a machine called a sputter coater and it ionizes the gold particles so that they settle in a very thin layer on the specimen. And gold is the best one because it tends to deposit a very thin layer and that keeps the details from becoming obscured. Oh. All right, so the pictures that were in the game were very colorful, very beautiful. Is that what they look like under a microscope? So the pictures from the game were taken with the electron microscopes and since they don't use light, they only produce an image in black and white. So all the pictures in the game were colorized using a computer program like Photoshop. All right, back to microscopes. The microscopes that we have, are they used in other fields? Oh yes, they're widely used in a lot of different fields. Like the medical field, for example, they use it to look at tissue samples and maybe blood samples. Um, material sciences can use it to look for defects in building materials. Computer sciences can use it to manufacture computer chips. And even forensic scientists use it to look for clues for crimes. So a variety of other fields. Very well. big variety, wide, widely used right. instruments. Another popular question coming through is what is in the background of your picture? Oh, so my backdrop is so my backdrop is Actinopictus 
and it is a genus of marine diatoms. Um, diatoms are phytoplankton that are encased in a glass shell called a frustule. And when these organisms die, their, their empty glass frustules sink to the bottom and become part of the sand. All right, one more question. What is the smallest thing you have ever seen on a microscope? So our transmission electron microscope is the most powerful and we have been able to see um, marine viruses on that microscope, which are a fraction of a bacteria. That's just fascinating. Thank you so much, Stephanie. This was so informative. I really think everyone's gonna get so much out of this and I appreciate that really fun game. Um, and so thank you to everybody who joined us today and thank you to our helper for sharing her screen with us. If you missed any of our sessions or if you wanna learn more, you can go ahead and visit us at myfwc.com slash marinequest. Well, thank you and have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Hope Bye, to see you next year.